Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I'm honored to welcome you today to our Food for Thought Breakfast series event titled Africa, Development, Freedom of Religion or Belief. For the first time, we're broadcasting our panel live through our Facebook page, so we welcome also our viewers who have joined us. I would like to thank our distinguished panelists for being here with us today to share their expertise on the wonderful African continent. Rachel Bahiani, Baha'i International Community, Leah Perecrest, Human Rights Without Frontiers, Nives Fernandez de Cotero Cicades, and uh, Mr. Peter Frisch, both from the European External Action Services. They will speak in this order, and we look forward to hearing their comments and recommendations. After the panel, we invite questions and an open discussion. Those following with the internet can ask questions by leaving a comment at any time during the live stream. Africa is a land of extremes, beautiful and untouched lands filled with wildlife and modern cities, extreme poverty and flourishing economies, extremisms, but also democracy and the rule of law, traditions and modernity. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has had a presence in Africa since 1853, but for the first 125 years, it was established only in Southern Africa. Since 1978, growth of the church there has been impressive. One of the most significant events in the history of the church in Africa was the dedication of the temple in Johannesburg in 1985, followed by the Accra Ghana and Abba Nigeria temples in 2004 and 2005, respectively. Today, there are more than half a million members attending our 1,800 congregations across the continent. Our commitment in Africa and its people is also exemplified by our humanitarian and development work. While always committed to support the poor and the needy, it was during the terrible famine that struck Ethiopia between 1983 and 1985 that millions of members of the church responded to the church leadership's call to donate in support of the international efforts. That was a transformational moment that led to the organizations of today's LDS charities, the humanitarian arm of the church. Since 1985, the church has provided 251.7 million US dollars worth of assistance in Africa. Today our programs include clean water, emergency response, immunization, maternal and newborn care, refugee response, vision care, well, wheelchairs, and other community projects. All programs are possible thanks to donations received by members of our faith and others, and require participation of the local communities to empower the recipients and increase sustainability. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is also the largest sponsor of the All African Law and Religious Symposium held annually on the continent. Each year, for the last five years, the conference gathered lawmakers, government and religious leaders from all over Africa to solve African issues relating to freedom of religion or belief from a legal jurisprudence and constitutional and justice perspective. This with the recognition of the empirical evidence of the link between religious freedom and economic growth and socioeconomic development. These events have been very well attended with some 50 delegates each year, the last one being in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Delegates delegates leave these conferences with concrete ideas, some of which are implemented at country level. This year's event is fully booked and will take place on 14th through 16th of May in Rabat, Morocco. The subject of the conference will be religion, law, and security, focusing on religious extremism, blasphemy, violence, terrorism, and human and sustainable security. However successful these events have been in expanding and protecting the space for religious freedom, it may not be the lawmakers or ministries of governments or even religions themselves who will help turn Africa into realizing its huge economic potential. It will take the will of the people, the faith of African individuals and communities from which the needed power for change will come. Only there can be found the required sincere resolve belief and influence that comes from the faith of the African people. Without the space to practice this faith, no lasting long-term difference can be made. In conclusion, this human right, the most basic of all, that undergirds the others, must be protected and promoted. Democracy and human rights will allow the African dream to be realized 
and their implementation and protection need the participation of all of us, churches, governments, civil society, and most importantly, individuals. We hope today's discussion will help highlight these important considerations in view of this year's EU Africa Summit and help develop useful suggestions. We will now hear without further delay from our speakers. We will start from Rochelle uh, and then followed by uh, Leah. Rochelle. Thank you, Francesco, and thank you for organizing um, this, this event. It's, it's very timely. Um, and um, sort of in discussion with Francesco, we thought that maybe I, I could just um, share some more um, informal thoughts and, and look at these concepts such as um, development and um, freedom of religion or belief sort of from a more conceptual um, angle. And so I was just thinking of starting with this notion of, of, of prosperity because simply, you know, our conception of prosperity is actually central to the way um, we understand development. And then we see that the development discourse today, it actually has come to this understanding that it's not enough to have material prosperity, nor that it is enough to have sort of, you know, the existence of a certain legal or even institutional framework. Because we've seen, and we keep on seeing it, that actually if you look at societies, where, let's say, those two conditions are, are roughly met, and I'm saying roughly because um, we, we all have to learn, um, but where they're roughly met, you see that these societies, they still really have a long way to go to learn about, you know, what social cohesion means, what is community building, what is family unit, unity, and how, how do we really see each individual as a trust of the society um, as a whole. And of course, this in no way means that, you know, to be prosperous in material means and in infrastructure and in technology is, isn't um, crucial, nor does it mean that we are downplaying the importance of, of, you know, this developments humanity has made. It doesn't mean either that it's not fundamental to live in a society where your rights are respected, but it simply means that, that we're increasingly witnessing, whether here or, or elsewhere, that it's, it's crucial and it's, it's just vital for societies to be infused and imbued with this profound understanding of the need for moral and spiritual values. And I always remember, um, it, I think it was the Brussels representative of UNHCR, and he was... Um, um, this was two years ago, and at a conference he was sharing how, um, how he was very touched with the response of, of Europeans to the refugee situation. He said that um, the acts of generosity that were emanating from European people everywhere, um, opening their homes, reaching out to people, was unprecedented. And, um, and he said it's actually interesting to see that Europeans are, have learned to do this because of this situation. And um, that, that in Africa, for example, is, is, um, has been a habit that he's been seeing for decades. Um, so, of course, you know, then you start thinking that, yes, it's fundamental for refugees, you know, when they arrive to, to be sheltered. Um, to have access to certain material, um, you know, conditions. And it's also fundamental, of course, for them to be able to introduce their claims and um, have a legal system that adequately responds to that. But then you also start seeing that what makes a refugee actually truly welcome, um, you know, aren't necessarily those two things. They're linked to it. But they're this, this sort of profound... Um, you know, sense of generosity coming from the local population. And that's what the refugee, when the refugee starts really feeling at home. Now, this is in no wise to sort of introduce um, simplistic narratives and to say that, you know, one part of the world does this better, another uh, does that better. It's, it's a lot more subtle and there's nuances everywhere. But it's just to say that 
every country in the world has a long way to go to really reach true prosperity. And then one sees that it's not meaningful to sort of categorize the world into south and north, or into developed and underdeveloped. We're all on this path of learning how to reach true prosperity. And really, we can all, whether Europeans or Africans, on equal footing, contribute our share of insights on what we're learning on this path. So now if we look at this, this notion of freedom of religion or belief, and just to um, <clears throat> say a few words that, that are linked to it, but not, not directly at this stage, is to see, say that when you, when you look at what, what social transformation entails, and, and really if you have in mind the kind of progress that leads you towards this true prosperity, then you see it, it's not good enough to say that you know, this society would be a better society if its individuals were more spiritual or were better people. That would be naive to assume such a thing. For a society to progress, actually there's, needs, there's a need for its structures, its systems, its institutions, and its processes to be equally infused with values. So then on one hand, one sees that it's not meaningful to introduce dichotomies such as, you know, it's fine for people to live according a certain set of values in their private lives, but those values should not be allowed to have an impact on the public sphere. On another hand, religion, beyond sort of being concerned, you know, with the spiritual development and growth of an individual is intimately concerned with systems, with structures, and with processes of society. And then it becomes interesting to think about sort of the role of religion in development and not merely the role of spirituality in development thinking. Now, just to link that to freedom of religion and belief, we see that really European societies have come a long way in providing freedom of religion and belief to their citizens, both legally and um, at the level of discourse. And yes, there is a lot to learn, but they've come a long way. But then, if you think about the need for religion and not just spirituality to play a role in society, we also believe that there's value in reflecting more, more profoundly about freedom of religion or belief and what it means. In other words, consideration needs to be given to the fact that people should not be only allowed to be spiritual in their sort of private sphere, that, but that they should also be allowed to tap into you know, that source of, of, of motivation and spirituality they have to contribute to, to the public sphere. In other words, we need to think about what role religion can play in the public sphere. And then, if you look at the world, then you see that, yes, in one part of the world, you know, we protect um, the freedom of religion and belief of the private sphere very well. But then you see that in other parts of the world, so there's actually more freedom um, to be able to contribute, you know, to, to draw on your religious convictions and contribute with that to the public sphere. Um, so again, this is in no wise to downplay the existing challenges to, to FORP and in, in, to sort of freedom of religion or belief um, in, 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 in some parts of the world, nor uh, to downplay the devastating consequences of, limitate, of limitations imposed upon individuals to practice their beliefs. But it's just to simply highlight sort of different dimensions of a certain concept. And I was thinking that, you know, one could sort of easily say that, well, those two things, they're actually diametrically opposed uh, in the sense that whenever there is, you know, a possibility or sort of where there's more ease in drawing on religion in the public sphere, there's also less, you know, freedom on the private. And actually, if you look at the world, it's not true. And the other thing is that, you know, 
I think we're at a stage where we need to be able to do both. And I think historically, um, we've learned to do sort of either or um, in some ways well. And so, but then how do we, you know, introduce into our thinking increasing levels of complexity and, you know, the ability of combining both. And it's almost, I was just this morning, I was thinking of this example, and of course it's just an example, and examples are always limited because they're examples. But um, just thinking is almost like saying, you know, um, just because the internet and, or let's say, just because we see that, you know, some people um, use the internet for purposes that, you know, that they shouldn't use it for, let's get rid of, you know, technology as a whole. And, and so, you know, we, we need to be able to have technology, but then also, you know, um, certainly, you know, ensure that the internet is used for the right purposes. So, <clears throat> but again, just to say that we all as societies have a lot um, to, to learn. And, and that there's a need to, to revisit some of these concepts. Now about sort of development, because Francesco asked me to, to really emphasize that um, there's a, the Baha'i community in, 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 in Africa is big. It's present in, in every um, African country, and probably there's Baha'is belonging to every um, African tribe. And that there's also a lot of um, sort of Baha'i-inspired social economic development projects that, uh, or endeavors that are in Africa. And, and this really will take me to the third notion that I wanted to explore here, which is this notion of development itself. And, and the way that notion is currently sort of being conceptualized in this Baha'i-inspired social and economic development endeavors. And, and the way it's conceptualized, it actually stems from this broader understanding of all of us walking on a path of learning. If the division, or if this division of the world into developed and underdeveloped is one's conceptual framework, then really development essentially becomes this, this product to be delivered from one part of the world, the so-called developed world, to another part of the world, which is then the so-called underdeveloped world. Such a framework really views actually the masses of humanity as, as victims, as poor, as needy, and essentially as sort of recipients of aid and training. And such a framework makes us focus on the fragility of a community rather than on its strength. And if you actually see no capacity or no strength within a community, you think that you need to bring it from outside. And then despite acknowledgement of sort of the importance of local participation as a principle, in reality, activities are then not managed at the grassroots but by higher level organizations that are far removed from the reality of that particular community and where the scope of the decision making left to the people in the community is at best secondary. But then if however your framework is a framework of one of looking at strength and really seeing in each community um, <clears throat> great capacity, then your development approach will also be radically different. Development is then not something that is brought from outside in, but that is really driven from constructive sources within. Of course, this does not mean that help from outside is, is redundant. It just simply means that a development activity should emerge from within a community and actually belong to the people and the institutions of the community. And then it also means that the success of any development endeavor, it's not measured by how many sort of goods you've been delivering, as helpful as these goods may be, but it's measured by this increasing capacity of local communities and institutions 
to really make decisions about their spiritual and material progress. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for this uh, presentation about the. Uh, uh, I really liked your uh, comment on the development of something that should come from within the communities rather than be imposed from from outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organizers and to the, my uh, fellow panelists. Um, so today I'm going to be discussing more on the logistical side of freedom of religion or belief in Africa and kind of explore um, the perpetrators of these violations in a number of different countries. Um, so I'll begin with Eritrea. Um, so the status of freedom of religion or belief in Eritrea is largely dependent on the fact that the government is so oppressive and that it's run by the dictator, uh, President Eforki, um, and he's regarded as one of the most autocratic leaders in the world. Um, so there's about 6.3 million people um, in Eritrea, and of course, since information coming out of Eritrea is limited, there are different um, numbers given as far as um, the, relig the religion of the population. Um, the U.S. Department of State considers the population to be roughly half Christian, half Muslim. Um, Pew um, predicts that the population is uh, more Christian, with 63% Christian and 37% Muslim. Um, more specifically, the Department of State um, approximates that 50% of the population is Sunni Muslim, 30% Orthodox Christian, and 13% Roman Catholic. So legally, Eritrea recognizes four religions, uh, the Eritrean Orthodox Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Eritrea, the Roman Catholic Church, and Islam. Um, these religions are by no means completely free because they're legally recognized. They are required to submit activity reports. Um, they cannot accept any funding from abroad, and a lot of their religious leaders are appointed by the state. Um, there have also been reports that the state does um, run surveillance programs on on these official religions. Um, for non-official religions, in 2002, the government created a law where religions have to apply to be recognized. Um, since 2002, there have been numerous applications, including from the Baha'i community, the Presbyterian Church, Methodist Church, and many more. Um, but none have gained recognition since 2002 when the law was created. Um, the international community pressured the Eritrean government on this law, and they had asked, um, submitted a series of questions about it, and the Eritrean government responded, which was surprising, but they did respond. Um, and they said that Eritrea has a his, uh, rich history of religious tolerance. The government of Eritrea has obligations to ensure that centuries-old religious tolerance and harmony is not um, protruded by the externally induced new trends of Islamic or Christian fundamentalism that corrode the social fabric. So I think that that's, that statement leads to what we see in a lot of these countries, as I'll be further discussing, is that new religions pose some sort of security threat to a state. So while in theory the Constitution of Eritrea does protect freedom of religion or belief, it is not yet... Um, it is not yet um, protected at all. The, the whole entire um, constitution has never actually been implemented. Um, so at Human Rights Without Frontiers, a lot of the work that we do is documenting prisoners in countries. And currently, we have documented 64 freedom of religion or belief prisoners in Eritrea. 54 of who are Jehovah's Witnesses that are in prison um, for refusing to serve in military services. And this group is really repressed in Eritrea. Um, the president in 1994 outlawed the group um, for their refusal to participate in military activities. Um, and they cannot uh, obtain any identity cards or travel documents, which also means that they cannot have government jobs, they can't have a business license, um, they can't get married, and they can't purchase land without, without these identification papers that they need. Um, so while I said the, 
the country is extremely closed and it's really hard to predict the numbers in there, um, the U.S. Department of State reports that there's anywhere from 1,200 to 3,000 freedom of religion or belief prisoners um, in the country. As I mentioned, we have 64, which I think shows how restrained the information coming out of the country is. Um, and furthermore, those that are in prison are facing extremely dangerous conditions. Um, torture is really widespread. Um, it's been reported that that freedom of religion or belief prisoners are, are subject to particularly bad circumstances in prison. They're sent to the harshest prisons with the longest punishments, uh, prison terms. Um, some of those who have been released from prison have reported that they were held in solitary confinement for a very long time. Um, there were some who were even reportedly kept underground um, in some sort of bunker, and they were kept in shipping containers as well, severely overcrowded shipping containers. Um, those are just the stories who have, that have gotten out, so who knows past then. Um, and similar to Rochelle's presentation, um, I think this is a case where refugees really need to be protected. Um, the UN reported that since 2015, 6% of the Eritrean population has fled. Um, so in Eritrea, this is an example of, of really top-down government-run repression. Um, and I mean, solutions have been wide, various arms embargoes, but those, of course, um, have the, the trickiness of humanitarian aid and sanctions. Um, so I'm going to switch now on to another example, which is Sudan, which is really different than Eritrea because it has a less religiously diverse population and it has recently experienced civil war. So in Sudan, the population is, according to reports, 97% Muslim. Um, so Christians are estimated at 3% of the populations. Um, they include Coptic, Greek, <coughs> Ethiopian, Eritrean Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and more. So the president, of course, as you may know, Omar al-Bashir, he was indicted in 2009 by the ICC for conducting brutal campaigns of mass killings, rape, pillage of civilians in Darfur. And during the long civil war between Khartoum government in the north and the successionist movements in the south, religion really play played a key role. The North is um, based on a very rigid interpretation of Sharia, and the South is largely Christians and communities that follow more tra uh, uh, traditional African religions. And when the conflict ended in 2011, the Republic of Sudan was created. But this by no means, uh, there's still Christian minorities that exist in Sudan, uh, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, Presbyterians, uh, various Orthodox communities, etc. And these communities aren't new either. They've been there for a very long time. So um, today, after the Civil War, um, freedom of religion and belief is still greatly repressed. Um, President al-Bashir in 2011 created a new constitution that was to be Islamic, that would be based on Sharia for, for the main source of legislation, which in and of itself poses freedom of religion or belief restrictions to the minorities um, in the country. Um, so a series of, of new laws were created with that. That includes um, apostasy, which can be um, punishable by death, um, blasphemy, um, as well as um, restrictions on building permits for churches. Um, so there have been a number of cases that have reached international attention, um, including the arrest of the Czech citizen, Peter Jacek, last year. He has been released since um, with, with diplomatic pressures coming from the Czech Republic. And he was arrested in, and charged alongside three reverends that are, that are from Sudan, and um, two of them are still in prison. Um, and they were charged with seven crimes overall. Uh, and um, they were ultimately charged with the death penalty. Um, so I hope the international community also focuses some attention onto the other two prisoners who have not yet been released. Um, so similar to to Eritrea, it still is a, a very government-perpetrated 
violation of freedom of religion or belief. Um, but I think that the post-war situation means that they're at a different level of development as far as legislation goes compared to Eritrea. Um, and then the other country that I would like to briefly focus on before I move on to a slightly different topic that's going to be more on security is Algeria. Um, not many people know about um, the recent, well, kind of recent um, crackdowns on the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in, in Algeria. Um, in 2017, um, many followers of the Ahmadiyya faith were arrested. Um, they have not been tried. They have not been sentenced. Um, we know where they were arrested, but that is about it at this point. Um, so that is just like the one thing I wanted to give on Algeria, um, since it is an underreported case, I believe, um, and lesser known. So Eritrea, Sudan, and Algeria are just um, a couple of examples of countries in which the government persecutes religious groups um, via national laws. So the status of freedom of religion or belief there is really focused, uh, is really reflective of their government structures and judiciary systems. But when trying to look for um, sources, for lack of a better term, for, for violations of FORB, we also see another actor who largely contributes to the repression of religious groups across Africa, which is uh, violent extremist groups or terrorist groups. Um, you can choose whatever phrasing you would like. I know they're, they're all contested in different ways. Um, so um, I'm particularly going to highlight Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram. And those will be Somalia, Kenya, and Nigeria. Um, so Al-Shabaab mostly operates out of Somalia and Kenya. Um, to give a bit of a history of the group, um, it came to prominence in Somalia as the military wing of the Union of Islamic Courts in 2006. Um, its stated goals are to turn Somalia into an Islamic state, uh, to build a greater Somalia, including areas in the neighboring countries where, where large Somalian ethnic groups um, live, and to spread its strict <coughs> version of Islam. So since 2007, um, Al-Shabaab has fought both Somali and regional forces in its campaign to control Somalia. And at times they held really large portions of territories. Um, in 2012, it pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda. And in 2015, they were, became divisions within the group between whether they should pledge allegiance to Al-Qaeda or, or ISIL. Um, so then with that, those who pledged support to ISIL were um, executed by those who supported Al-Qaeda. Um, so that's just some background about the group. Um, and in the past year, they have um, attacked the African Union mission in Somalia, um, the Somali National Army, and civilians in central and southern Somalia. Um, so they have targeted and killed a lot of um, government officials, international Repre uh, representations and Somalia, Somalian citizens. Um, so in, in addition, Al-Shabaab con continued to uh, brutally enforce its extremist interpretation of Islamic law and killed many Christians, accusing them of sorcery. Um, they are also known to lash individuals um, who are accused of rape or adultery, and it's very stringent um, and its application of Sharia law. But it's not, unfortunately, the only actor that's rep uh, repressing freedom of religion or belief in Somalia. The state itself is highly federalized um, and govern, <coughs> and um, the regions govern their respective areas in different ways. Um, so Al Shabaab does control one part of it, and the central government does. Can, cannot maintain control of those those areas. So the small and and low profile Christian groups and converts are really vulnerable to social social persecution due to this, um, I guess, constant propaganda from from Al Shabaab that's spread around the country. Um, so they cannot proselytize. They cannot convert. It's not socially acceptable at all. Um, and the few who do. Um, worship usually in secret house churches. 
Um, there's only one church that exists in Somalia, a church building. That is the St. Anthony Padua in, in Hargeza. Um, and, and Somali clerics throughout the state have, um, have stated that Christianity, Christians, and churches are antithetical to Somalia. So they, the, the state refused to report the killing of any Christian converts by al-Shabaab. They just completely ignored them, related, erased them off of the books. Um, and there are, of course, some other laws that also limit the freedom of religion or belief of Christians. So to, to switch now to al-Shabaab in Kenya, this is the point that I'd really like to highlight, is that Kenya is a majority Christian country. Um, they do have a significant Muslim population in the capital and along the coast. Um, and, and, and recently, um, well, since 2011, al-Shabaab has, has launched a series of attacks in Kenya, mostly um, targeting government officials, etc., but they also have targeted some Christian populations. And, and in response, the Kenyan government has has really started wide-scale and large-scale targeting and collection, uh, collective punishment of Somali citizens, ethnic Somalis, and other Muslims. Um, they initiated the Operation Uslama Watch, um, which was to identify and, and arrest uh, al-Shabaab terrorists and sympathizers in Kenya. Um, but the operation... Um, expanded along all the, the Muslim-majority communities. And in 2016, it was reported that security officers were targeting entire ethnic and religious communities and committed gross human rights abuses, um, including arbitrary arrests, extortion, illegal detention, torture, killings, and disappearances. The Kenyan government, of course, denies this. Um, so... Um, Yusuf recently came out with its report, and in it, Christian leaders had told them that they feel really threatened by al-Shabaab um, and that the churches were starting to hire armed guards. Um, in addition, the government has been really um, back and forth um, in, their, in their, their laws pertaining to religion. Um, for example, they increased funding for madrasas, and at the same time, they enabled the government to appropriate church buildings to use as public schools. But on the other hand, they also um, banned female students from wearing headscarves. Um, and at the same time, they have made marriage laws harder for Christians to obtain, um, according to these Christian leaders who have reported to USERF in the past year. So the legal changes have really um, perpetrated a lot of tension within the population between Muslims and Christians feeling that the government may be giving preference to one group over the other. So while well, in the last cases we saw mainly government perpetrated violations of freedom or religion or belief, al-Shabaab also seriously um, complicates this. Um, in Nigeria as well, we see, we see a lot of the, um, the same thing since they have Boko Haram, uh, which is a terrorist organization which has a similar mes message to al-Shabaab. Um, and they also have really long-standing strife between communities. Um, and I think that oftentimes the conflicts that take place, um, specifically in, in the rural areas, they, they start out as a land conflict of some sort, but below this, this level, it, it, it takes on religious undertones. Um, and I think that's that's a good way to describe a lot of a lot of the local community conflicts that are going on in Nigeria is that they take on this religious undertone so it becomes a religion based conflict for many people involved um, and we see that there was a lot of outbreaks of violence after elections and um, a lot of revenge attacks between the two groups um, and I mean we're talking big numbers um, for example last March um, there was an estimated 100 to 300 killed um, and six villages destroyed, and that's just in one case. On December 19th, um, the Catholic Archdiocese uh, of, of Kafankan uh, reported that in 2016, at least 800 were killed in sectarian violence in 53 villages across Kaduna. Um, 16 churches were also destroyed. Um, and, the, and the Nigerian government really has not responded to any of this. Um, 
So as I said, Boko Haram is also, I mean, that, that's just between communities. Boko Haram is further exasperating these problems. Um, since May 2011, it's, it's predicted that they've killed more than 28,000 people. Um, so, I mean, the Nigerian government has done very limited stuff with Boko Haram trying to ad address radicalization issues. Um, they have detained Boko Haram fighters, but they don't, there's no trials or convictions. They're just kind of held in prison. Um, so, so they're not doing much to alleviate uh, the, the hatred that's coming out of the Boko Haram conflict. Um, and in addition, they have their own laws that are restricting FORB, and there's the communities themselves that, that have yet to reach a dialogue with one another. Um, so I think Nigeria is, is a particularly um, um, complex case that, that kind of has freedom of religion or belief violations and, and complexities on all levels in the state. Um, so, I mean, in all, like, I, I, I chose these cases to kind of paint a picture of all the different ways that, that freedom of religion or belief is, is violated or, or used as, um, like, a tool of hatred um, in, in all of these different countries. And I think that, um, I mean, looking, looking inward at ourselves in the EU as, as institutions or as NGOs, et cetera, I think one thing that we can really... Um, work towards is to set an example to not have to not have further violations of freedom of religion or belief in response to terrorist organizations extremist organizations and i think that's a problem that we're really going to face soon um, as we see in in um in kenya after the attacks they started to repress religious groups and i, and I really think that a way that we can help is setting an example i mean the the eu has served as as the champion of human rights for, for so long. Um, I think that's really somewhere that we have to go. Um, I think that uh, in these communities, as Rochelle was saying, it does have to be something that, that comes from within, and there are certainly ways that, that we can um, aid, foster those, those progresses. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a big thing is going to be dialogue in the, in the local communities. I think that's... Um, a tool that really hasn't started on the level that it needs to. And I mean, it's, it's, of course, I've never been in that situation. I don't, I don't think many of us have, and that it's going to be a hard hurdle to jump. Um, but as Rochelle said, prosperity has to be the end goal for, for everyone. And um, there, there are different ways that us as the EU, us as individuals, us as CSOs, religious groups, etc., can can contribute and and be an example to these communities that are facing violations on so many levels in their countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, for your uh, detailed report. It's very interesting how the discussion of uh, that progress must come from within is uh, is stressed for the, for for the second time. Um, after Rachel and Leah, who have represented the religion, religious, and civil society perspective, we will hear from uh, uh, Nivis and, uh, and Peter, uh, bringing the perspective of the uh, European Union, in particular the External Action uh, Service. Hello. Good morning. I, uh, I would like to, to give you a little bit an overview of what are the main actions the European External Action Service and the European Union in general are doing to, to promote freedom of religion outside the European Union. I mean, just to start, I would like to say that uh, it has been clear, you know, the policy of the European Union, and I think it's very important to recall it, that we treat freedom of religion as an universal human right. And therefore, we, we believe that, you know, like, just the mere fact of respecting freedom of religion is a safeguard for respecting diversity. And this is very important because the free exercise of freedom of religion directly contributes to democracy, to development, to rule of law, to peace and stability. So it's not strange that uh, in many of the countries where we perceive severe restrictions to freedom of religion, this is not isolated, but there are also severe restrictions to many human rights. 
We believe that all persons have the right to manifest their religion individually or in community with others and in private or in public. As our colleague says, it's not only the fact of uh, having uh, your freedom of opinion or your freedom of thought, but it's also needed that you are also free to manifest them. Violations of uh, freedom of religion or, or belief committed by both the state or non-state actors are widespread and very complex and affect people in all of the world, including inside the European Union. One of the um, main tools that uh, the European Union External Action Service has at its disposal for the promotion of freedom of religion or belief is the guidelines of freedom of religion or belief. These EU guidelines on freedom of religion or belief were adopted by the Foreign Affairs Council in 2013, and they are a tool for our uh, delegation staff and from the member city of the member states of the South European Union to try to better understand the right of freedom of religion and belief itself, but also in a practical way to give them the tools that are at our disposal to try to fight against any restriction or violation of freedom of religion, but also to promote it. And since the adoption of these guidelines in 2013, it has also been reflected in our financial assistance, the need of this promotion of this right. Uh, 4B, as you know, it's a very sensitive issue in many countries, so the ways of engaging in dialogue according to religious freedom has to be uh, developed in case by case. Just uh, as a little bit an overview, it doesn't mean that we will be doing all these actions in all the single countries, but just to, to, to show you a little bit what are the main actions of, of the European Union, I would say that the European Union um, raises issues of freedom of religion in their dialogues with uh, third countries. At the moment, we have more than 40 specific human rights dialogues with uh, countries outside the European Union where freedom of religion is raised in a way or another. But it doesn't stop only that. I mean, this is our structured dialogue, but we have a engagement with many countries around the world, and with all of them, we try to raise these issues of freedom of religion and belief. Um, this has been done in different ways. There is a public defense of freedom of religion, for example, condemning violence. This is unanimous. The European Union is, is ready to condemn violence uh, when it is exercised uh, on, on the name of freedom of religion and condemns violence in general to anyone that suffers violations in these regards. And this is demonstrated through several public demarches and statements that are published every year. Just to give an example, since the beginning of 2017, there has been seven statements in relation with freedom of religion and belief. And um, these statements are sometimes the most visible tool of the European Union to react against uh, restrictions or violation, but it's not the only one, which means that the European Union also reacts with private diplomacy, which many times there may not be a statement publicly, but there are uh, private demands that is uh, exercises with third countries' governments to talk with them, to try to engage with them in the need of protecting freedom of religion and belief. And then we also have financial instruments that are fully dedicated uh, to freedom of religion or belief uh, or have a special part of it. Since 2013, approval of the guidelines on freedom of religion or belief, the European Instrument for Human Rights and Democracy has been having a part of it dedicated to the promotion of freedom of religion. It started in 2014 where we were focusing more on, on, on root organizations and on minorities because many times, I mean, unfortunately, freedom of religion and uh, belief repression is linked also to the rights of minorities. But no, not only that, and now uh, in 2017, one of the lots of the EDHR will be dedicated to freedom of religion and belief. And we have introduced also the component of uh, com religious communities as, as well as, you know, like the, the, the link of freedom of religion with other rights. So this call will be published most likely uh, at the, during the, the summer or, the, or in June, but uh, there has been already an information session. Yes, to, to see the link between our action on freedom of religion and the importance of development, I think one of the most recent examples of that has been the appointment of a special advisor, uh, Jan Figel, special advisor for freedom of religion of belief outside the European Union, who is advisor to Commissioner Mimika. So I think it's just another example of how important it is for us this link between freedom of religion and development. You can see it also in our projects because it's not only the EDHR. Right now we have ongoing almost 40 projects worldwide on freedom of religion, accounting more than 15 million in total. So it's part and parcel of all the things that we are doing. And not only that, but I think it's very important to mention that freedom of religion is mainstream 
in all our policies. So because there is not a specific component on freedom of religion in a finance, finance in one state, it does not mean that there is not, for example, linked to other human rights. And I think this link to other human rights is very important. Like, for example, we have been recently seeing how it is important that uh, in order to be able to exercise freedom of religion, especially in countries in Africa, we need freedom of association. This is reflected, for example, on Mayaki Ai's recent report on freedom of association and the link to radicalism, how it could be the instrumentalization of religions ca can be used to restrict freedom of association and therefore to restrict freedom of religion per se. So I think it's very important, and therefore in the guidelines of the European Union for the promotion of freedom of religion and belief, the link with freedom of expression, the link with human rights defenders, and the link with freedom of association and peaceful assembly, it's highlighted. And I think it's something that it's very important that we keep on doing. Another of the instruments that uh, we had in the European Union to promote freedom of religion and belief are high-level visits. We use these high-level visits by either our EU uh, representatives or the representatives of our member states in third countries to pass messages and to try to promote freedom of religion and belief. Most recently, we have, for example, the visit of Mr. Jafigel to Sudan, where he was very conscious of the problems there, as the examples that the LIA has put to us, and he raised the issues. But not only that, we also have our special representative on freedom of, uh, or sorry, on human rights, Stavros Lamlinidis, that has been very active on freedom of religion and belief. And most lately, he attended a high-level seminar in New York on on anti-Muslim hatred that uh, had been followed an anti-Semitism uh, high-level forum in September. And he is very much engaged in the UN Rabat um, process of action, which we believe it's very important to establish this uh, link between freedom of expression and, and freedom of religion. Um, apart from, from all these actions and uh, about uh, the, the financing of uh, freedom of religion, we also uh, are very aware of the link of uh, freedom of religion and intercultural dialogue. Therefore, the European Union is committed to promote this dialogue, interreligious dialogue, intercultural dialogue, to try to open spaces for society to strengthen the link between freedom of religion and, and diversity as an important thing for development and to the establishment of rule of law and stability in the countries. There will be, uh, there has been a call uh, published on 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 March by the European Commission on Intercultural Dialogue and Culture. In, in this, you know, like they, 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 they are advocating for a dialogue and a peaceful intercommunity relations. I think it's another of, uh, I mean, it shows how the European Union is uh, making more this link between intercultural dialogue and freedom of religion and the importance of development. And another of the angles I wanted to raise is uh, education. I think education is very important, especially in the context of the African continent. And for us, there is very important need that the education shows diversity and that freedom of religion is considered not only when we talk about uh, uh, the community in general, but also mainstream in sectoral policies, like, for example, education. And I wanted to stop here because I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview and feel free to ask any question after in the question and answer. And I leave my colleague Peter, which is much more expert than I, to give you an overview on more geographical issues. Okay. Well, I'm certainly not an expert on, on, on freedom of religion, but if you see the, the, the definition of an expert, uh, that is somebody working abroad very far from, from his home and having an average knowledge of what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. So, but let's be serious. Uh, my, my name is Peter Fish. I'm working on, on Pan-African issues. Um, I've been working for 25 years on, on MEDA, Middle East, North Africa, on the Arab Spring. <coughs> Uh, I forecasted the, these events five years before they happen. Um, and um, now I'm working in Africa on, on the f in the fields of human rights, good governance, uh, and as a, a political economist. Um, I was asked Friday afternoon um, to, to join, and, and um, it's with pleasure, and I understood that the idea was to give you a bit of feeling of our relations with Africa and, and, and 
also in the view of the summit, of the upcoming summit. Um, and I'll have to struggle with some notions that uh, Rachel pointed uh, uh, rightly that need to be revisited uh, and, and uh, updated. But uh, nobody is perfect, and, and uh, we, we are in this permanent process. I agree that this top-down attitude we have had in, uh, in the past, uh, or certain of us have had in the past, is not, is not the right attitude. We are not talking about North House, and um, we are not talking about governance and populations also in terms of top-down attitude. This should not be the case. We should aim uh, to a partnership between equals and we see that uh, this is not only a cliché, we see that the threats and the problems we are facing um, are very similar on, on, the, on the two continents. Even if it's at a different uh, development level, if you want, in terms of, of GDP per population, but this doesn't tell uh, too much. Um, so we have um, both continents in the last years, we have had to fight with, with, with an economic situation that, that was getting difficult and with, with uh, security issues that uh, threatened um, populations on both continents. And um, I think what emerged from that is, uh, is, was a concept, um, I call it the three Ps, uh, what should we aim at? Um, first, it's peace. Then it is uh, um, prosperity, but prosperity in a revisited way. Um, 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 and then it would be the third P would be partnership. Um, let me talk about those three Ps and then give you a, a small uh, introduction to, to, to what the summit um, uh, should have as priorities and will have as priorities because with our African partners uh, we, we, we agree that, for example, the question of the youth uh, should be one of the f uh, main um, uh, subject. Um, so when it comes to peace, um, of course, Leah has given a very good, a very good um, view of how problematic it is. In, 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 uh, we have seen a situation which was slowly rolled back in, 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 in Somalia and Horn of Africa and, and, and a, a continued spread in, in, in the Sahel region, Lake Chad region and Gulf of Guinea. For me as a person, this is particularly something which is very, very mm, difficult to accept because as a student I was traveling in northern um, Niger and in Mali also and I was sleeping uh, uh, outside sur un lit de camp. Uh, the only thing which I had to protect me was a mosquito net and I was sitting around the fireplace uh, talking with Tuareg and, and sharing, sharing food and, and discussing things. And it's particularly um, sad that those people have not been listened to and that they had made this alliance now with, with, with um, the terrorists for, for time. Um, what is also um, very difficult to accept, of course, is that all those criminal and, and terrorist activities um, are threats to human rights and threats to the poor people and particularly threats also to women and young people. Mm, I've been in, in, in the Gambia end of last year and we discussed uh, the women's situation in those crisis region and they started to say the women are really now the battlefield, because you even don't need a bullet to hurt a woman. Uh, you see what I mean? And 
And in, in some regions, it's more dangerous to be a woman than to be a soldier. Uh, so this um, brings us to, to have a really deep thought about that we need to, to address the root causes of this situation, which no doubt is poverty, lack of security, lack of rights. And I think for young people, it is the feeling not to be heard. I mean, young people uh, in Africa, they talk about young people being less than 30. It's more than 60% of the population, if you add the kids to it. And those people are just, you know, having the feeling they are not heard. In, in Gambia, you, you go through the villages, you don't find young people anymore. They have all gone. Um, so it's really a big, big, big problem. Prosperity is linked to it. Uh, prosperity, uh, when I mean prosperity, I mean, of course, that, um, of course, money is not everything, but if you don't have, uh, have the, the basic needs covered uh, the, in material ways, um, you have a problem. And even if, if, if Africa has been a, 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 a continent of growth, of very good growth, it has not been inclusive. That means that, that people, uh, that uh, as an economist, you would define it through the Gini index, so the distribution of income is very unequal. And, and, and uh, you have a lot of poor. You have a lot of people working in informal sectors. Uh, so without social security, without income, without social safety net, and those people uh, can very easily lose their job. And if they have health problem, they will, of course, lose it. And then we have in Africa the very, um, um, the developments which, which led to a global um, down, downturn in the trend. That means that commodity prices and energy prices went down. And at the same time, some countries had to fight Ebola. And Ebola has not only has uh, had uh, um, um, its uh, fall down on the situation of the countries concerned, but also the neighboring countries. And um, so um, we, we certainly need um, inclusiveness and, and sustainability in terms of, uh, of uh, governance and, and uh, growth. The third word is partnership. Uh, we are not looking at those countries or this continent as, as uh, ex-colonials. Uh, at least we should not do that. We should um, look at it as, as um, partners. We see that, for example, in Europe, we also have the problem of young people uh, being less and less um, um, impressed or, or, or even having less and less acceptance for politics and going into volunteering and not taking part of, on, of, the, of the general life. And, 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 and uh, you see that in election processes where, where um, uh, the, 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 the conservative uh, parties get more and more votes, but not, uh, I mean, of course, the, the very right-wing parties. Um, in terms of partnership, of course, we have to look at, at those problems and we have to look for solutions together. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm, I'm, I'm really of the opinion that African problems need to be solved in Africans by Africans. And that's why when I talk about human rights and things like this, I want to base my work on the work of the organs of the human rights organs that have been created in Africa. Of course, there is ICC when it comes to break of, 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 uh, of, of human rights and justice must be made. But we have to bear in mind that we have in Africa an African Commission of Human and People's Rights in Banjul that is a very, very good organization. There is a child 
organization based uh, in South Africa, but which will move to another countries, and there's the African court. So we have to work uh, maximum with those uh, institutions. And when I go to Africa and talk to human rights, uh, I'm not going to go as a teacher. I'm going to tell my, my friends, listen, I'm German. Uh, I have seen wh what it means not to respect human rights, even if I was not part of it. I've seen Auschwitz. And that's why I'm particularly committed to human rights, and that's why I'm sure that human rights is what what, what, what and, and, and regional integration as we had in Europe. Europe is a peace project for 60, 70 years. Without Europe, we wouldn't have peace. And, and people tend to, to forget that. Um, now on the, on the summit, we are, we are in preparation of the, of the um, Abidjan summit, which will take part in, in, in uh, which will take place in November. Uh, the overarching theme will be investing in the youth, knowing that Africa has a huge potential. Africa will see its population more than double till uh, 2050. And if young people don't feel they are part of this project, of this development, and if young people are excluded, we, we see where they go. They will, they will go uh, and, 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 and um, I always give the example, you go in the refugee camps in Algeria where, where you see where the people from, just an example, because I have visited them and, and, and looked at this situation, where the people from Western Sahara are for about 40, 40 years in refugee camps. You have a ter terrorist coming and giving them 500 euro. Uh, I don't know why only 10, they only recruited 10 people, apparently, the Minister of Security told me, in those camps. But in Algeria and the city, you can say it, people who have no income, who have no housing, who have no job, who have no perspective, what do they have to lose? Um, and one thing is, of course, very important. We have, if people then tell them it's a problem of religion, it's a problem of, uh, then it gets dangerous. We have seen it uh, with the Crusades in the past. We see it now with some forms of terrorism. Um, this this cannot be. Uh, the, the used in this way. I think um, so we need to work towards peace, we need to work towards uh, comprehension. Uh, we, we will continue to, to be a partner in development uh, with Africa. We are, the EU with the member states is more than half of the development aid but we need also to have good investment climate and when we look at the economic partner uh, parameters and and we need of course the, the the key thing is we need resilient economies resilient societies where people that are elected they are um, uh, redevable how you say they are um, uh, taken accountable for what they do. And that, that's the big challenge. Um, and um, voila, I think that's, that's the big challenge of, of Africa and our relations with Africa. And we need to be inventive and we need to, of course, to, to be innovative, think a bit out of the box not only talk about growth and things like this, but we need to look what is behind it. How can we reach young people? How can we motivate it, motivate them? We have recently have, and I will stop on that, our human rights dialogue with the African Union and with the organs of the African Union. 
and uh, we've had really interesting discussion on, on those subjects. Uh, it relates more also to uh, to good governance, and we have seen that that if you don't give people space for expressing themselves, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of association, you won't be able to to make progress. And combating terrorism is not limiting human rights, certainly not. And I have a very good report to recommend to you on that. Thank you. It was too long. Peter, that was just that was just fine. Thank you very much, all of you, for for your excellent contributions. Uh, now we have 15 minutes for questions. I will try to wrap up uh, all of the good things that have been said. So uh, I hope that the, my colleagues will help me if I miss anything. Uh, Rochelle went from discussing the important relig uh, role that religion plays in society as being embedded within its structures and, uh, and stressed the importance that changes must originate from within societies and not being imposed from a, uh, with a top-down approach. Leah uh, shared with us very detailed reports and, uh, and uh, from which we really understand that there is a lot to do, uh, must be done to protect this very important uh, right for many who are suffering. Uh, for uh, the lack of freedom to uh, live their own faith in a safe, uh, in a safe way. Nivas sh uh, shared with us all of the uh, tools that the EU and the EAS have uh, to promote freedom of religion or belief and uh, associated instruments within, uh, internationally, in particular in Africa. And Peter showed, um, I, I like your quote, again, stressing that African problems need to be solved by Africans in Africa. And, uh, and, the, and the three P's approach, peace, prosperity, and, uh, and partnership. We, we now uh, uh, have the floor open for questions. Uh, if you may want to, um, we'll take two or three together and then uh, start asking, uh, let the, uh, our speakers uh, reply. We do have a couple of comments coming also from, uh, from our online viewers, which we'll share after, uh, after you. Uh, Char Charlie. Thank you all for your remarks. Uh, my name is Charlie Weimers. I work for uh, MEP Laura Sadaktason of the EPP group. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Cotero uh, about the different instruments of the EAS. Um, you were mentioning that there is currently 40 ongoing dialogues, um, which, which include um, for in one way or the other. Uh, I would like to uh, hear you elaborate a little bit of, of the uh, Im improvements, if any, uh, as a result of this uh, EU diplomacy. Uh, would be interesting to hear what experiences we can draw upon, what we should promote, uh, also in terms of, of European Parliament. Uh, resolutions and other things in, in this regard. Also, intercultural dialogue, um, which is uh, uh, often very, very uh, important for establishing trust between key uh, clergy in countries, regions. Um, could you tell us whether the EU has been part of any such intercultural, inter interreligious dialogue that led to majority, uh, majority religion clergy ta taking action uh, in defense of minority uh, religious groups. Uh, that would also be very interesting to hear. Also, finally, uh, uh, one, one question uh, on the guidelines. Uh, when do you think that uh, an evaluation of the implementation of, of the guidelines uh, will take place? Thank you. Can actually take this because uh, it's a yeah. set of questions that. Okay. Well, very difficult questions indeed. I mean, like, how do you show action after after policy? This is one of the main and most important questions we have to ask ourselves. When it comes to the dialogues, I mean, like, 
I mean, I would love to take the credit of any, any kind of improvement in the world, uh, but it's very difficult to make any kind of link. Is it because they have a dialogue with the European Union? I don't think so. I mean, countries that we are saying, they, they improve by their people and with their people. The only thing that we can do is trying to be firm in our policies, trying to promote freedom of expression worldwide, and trying to engage in a dialogue in how can we help. I can put examples, for example. I can put examples of where a country had asked us. We are trying to reform our legislation, for example, and then we have offered help. Or they have asked, for example, our advice. We are trying to reform the law and freedom of association. How do you deal in Europe with uh, religious churches? And then we can offer help. And I think this you can see tangible improvements if the new law is more according to our policies, but how can you ensure implementation? It will depend on the country. So I think we should never give up on dialogue and on engagement and trying to offer in a help. We should never give up in condemning any kind of violence and express it in all the ways it's possible, publicly, privately, through dialogue. But I think one of the most important outcomes is that through engagement, sometimes we manage to change little realities that can translate in action. But if you ask me for statistics, for example, I think we don't have them. I mean, and we also have to consider that the, the human rights dialogue are, I think, by essence, a, a, a partnership agreement where also the European Union is criticized. I think we can also learn a lot on those dialogues about how the European Union inside has also problems on freedom of religion, and we heard from third countries, and as well we have to react. So I think it's, it's a, a mutual exchange when both parties learn. And I think for me, um, it's the most successful stories are not, on, not, not so much linked to a visible action, but to a slow motion towards improvement or developments. Changes in legislation mainly, but you cannot always take the credit, and I don't think it's our credit, it's the credit of their own thinking and changing, and the public opinion of those countries moving towards more human rights. And you can see recent examples in Africa, I mean, for example, on, on advances on human rights. And then on, on part of intercultural dialogue, not at all. I have never seen an incredible, but how can you do it? This is a slow motion work. I mean, we do as much as we can to try to improve the situation. And I think the results will be seen with time. I mean, to be completely honest, I would have to say that, you know, like uh, there is no a direct link between what we do and what happened. But I think we contribute to it. And then on the guidelines evaluation, we have been receiving this question quite often. I mean, like uh, the guidelines were adopted in 2013. Actually, operational, operational, it takes a time. So there has been several uh, implementation reviews. There had been already three times discussions in the Council Working Geographical, uh, sorry, in the Council Thematic Working Group on Human Rights, where we have presented the uh, uh, non papers on the implementation of the guidelines. There has been a reflection on how they have been implemented in the annual report of 2014 15, and uh, it will be in the 16. And also, we will have uh, as well the report on the midterm review of the action plan on human rights, where there is a section of freedom of religion where we try to. Um, report back on not only the guidelines on freedom of religion, but also the actions on freedom of religion contained in the action plan for human rights of the European Union. Right now we are considering if a, um, how kind of uh, evaluation can we, can, can we develop. Because in the guidelines we just said that an evaluation would take place, but we, we neither say in which form or, or which date exactly. So I would say that implementation or evaluation and implementation is done yearly, but we have not been public in a report about our implementation. And I think that the door is open now. I mean, we are here in civil society asking for that. So I think that internally we will have to think about which would be the best way to do it. I want to thank all of you very much for your presentations. Um, and, um, and there's so much that could be said around this topic in particular. And I could give numerous examples, actually, of intercultural, interreligious dialogues in the African continent. But it's generally not perpetuated by um, um, outside intergovernmental forces, nor the government themselves, and that's but often very much at a local level and with NGOs and international NGOs. Um, and it does have an effect, too. But um, I just want to say I really appreciate very much, Peter, what you said. 
and I can see that you've been around the block a few times in Africa because a lot of times we sort of throw up our hands and wonder what, you know, what can we ever do in Africa. And um, part of it is, uh, is ignoring the impact of African solutions for African people by Africans. And, um, and part of the difficulty is the overlay, the legacy that is present um, in Africa. Not, it's true we can't approach uh, them in an ex-colonial environment, but nor can we ignore that either because it has a long-term um, ongoing impact on um, African countries. And, um, and so, um, and one of the other legacies, though, too, that I, I would have liked to hear more about um, is the fact I was saying earlier that I think that um, most, in fact, most of the examples that were given here of uh, gross violations of freedom of religion or belief are directly related to external forces, um, either of colonial intervention or of uh, radical Islamist uh, ideologies and groups from, uh, from the Middle East, or um, also from um, uh, uh, interventions from really uh, neo-colonial um, situations that have been exported by the United States and European actors as well. Um, the legacy that I know in Africa, and I spent 10 years in Africa working um, uh, at a local level in numerous countries, and I've never found um, religion to be a difficulty except under those circumstances. And particularly, I, I speak in West Africa in particular, but, but I also worked in the Horn and in Central, uh, Central Africa. The African spirit is very much um, a spirit of pluralism, diversity, um, even countries that, uh, that we look at now, like Egypt, it was very common for Egyptians to, to attend one another's religious festivals and to be together. And it's only in the past generation, and this is the lens through which we look at a lot of what's happening now, that we see um, you know, terrible things happening. This is true. And, uh, and I'm not sure what uh, the solution is, but part of it is, I think, um, is for at an intergovernmental level as well as a very local level to, to encourage this kind of intercultural dialogue and education. The things that you mentioned are very, very important. Um, and focusing on youth is a crying urgency there. If you just look at the, the demographics in Africa, it's, um, and I too have been in villages where there, was, there were no young people they were all either killed or they fled or something like that. There are villages, numerous villages of older people in it. And um, it's very tragic. But what? But that doesn't mean that the, the young people are not there. They're somewhere. And they often migrate to urban centers and, and they just sort of stir the pot and it gets worse and worse and worse, you know. So um, uh, I guess a lot of it's just more commentary than anything else. I, I, I've been a long time advocate of Africa and, uh, and its ability to the resiliency against terrible odds, but just that a lot of the, the difficulty that we see in um, uh, as far as uh, freedom of religion, a lot of people in Africa look at Europe and wonder what our problems are actually with in that area, which are often more flagrant and, and obvious and visible than you see in um, in Africa, the Boko Harams and the Eritrea, you know, that those are aside, you know, but that's those are often because of repressive regimes that you can point to many other countries in our history too where that has been the case and a need to consolidate power and religion is very, very often um, intertwined with identity politics and, uh, and, and religious use, it's instrumentalized, but it's hardly ever, I've, I've rarely seen, I've, like to hear examples of um, of when religion was um, not linked in some way to uh, to a politicized element within that society to want to um, to gain power and to consolidate it. I really don't know many examples of that. So, David. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my experience of Africa is not as up to date as Mark's. Oh, sorry, David Fields then from the Anglican representation in Brussels. I worked in South Sudan and Kenya many years ago. I tried to keep in touch. Um, a question and then some remarks following on what, from what Mark said. 
I'd love to hear more from you, Peter, on this report you said that made it clear that uh, you don't combat terrorism by denying human rights. I mean, we've seen this wave of states of emergency in France, in Turkey, and in, in African countries, this heavy-handed response. Uh, Kenya was mentioned. So it's really good to see the, the evidence that this doesn't work. Um, as far as um, combating conflict through uh, intercultural dialogue, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury that I work for has a whole um, team working on reconciliation. Um, before he became a bishop, he was with the Coventry Cathedral Centre for International Reconciliation and went all over the trouble spots of the world. Uh, one uh, story of his which sticks in my mind comes from northern Nigeria when there was a particular time of intercommunal conflict that the leaders of the different religious communities got together and Muslim youth went out and defended churches and Christian youth went out and defended mosques from the mobs that were going around. So this can happen with the people on the ground getting together. So, so often um, there is the will in the grassroots, but it's this external interference which, uh, which stirs up things that shouldn't be going on. Given, uh, given the limited time, uh, I will take the last question to uh, some, some of the comments we received from, uh, uh, from our viewers. Uh, one is uh, Sean from South Africa. Uh, he, he, says, he says that there should be an authentic platform to promote and discuss these issues today. I'm here in Africa and awaiting the response of those involved. The response to these fundamental rights of all, to some degree, will influence the destiny of Africa. Then we have a comment from Heidi from Australia. That, uh, that really was uh, 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 impressed positively from the Peace, Prosperity, and Partnership. These are principles that are respectful and sustainable. This conversation is much needed. And Daniel, who says, this was again during Peter's uh, presentation, uh, he asked distribution of wealth, it enhances dependence and poverty. Um, this, uh, I think we have enough, uh, enough comments from... Uh, uh, from uh, Mark, David, and, and and our guests to involve the panel to close the uh, to close this event. So, who wants to get it first? Normally, I would say women first. <laughs> <laughs> we let you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just would like to do uh, three points. Um, from what I get from the discussion is first um, the intercultural dialogue. I just want to see, say that I had the privilege to be in, in Alexandria just after 9-11 uh, in a dialogue um, involving Muslims, Jews, uh, Copts, um, Catholics, um, communities. Uh, it was a dialogue from the Anna Lind Foundation and the Wilton Park. And what struck me the most is that the head of the Coptic Church of, of, um, of um, Egypt wrote to President Bush Jr. and said, don't hit back those, those people who committed those crimes. They are lost. It has nothing to do with religion. Don't hit back. They, they are lost. And... and um, think about what you will do uh, about this this problem. So it was a, really a message. We are not in a clash of cultures context. We are in another context. And I would also give, like to give a positive example on Algeria, which is a difficult country to disrespect. But we have been asked when I was uh, um, desk officer for Algeria to finance the renovation of the uh, church of the Cathedral d'Afrique, Notre Dame d'Afrique. And this was done uh, it, upon the request of the government of Algeria, who asked us to bring in money. Um, and now for the report, what I, what I propose, it's gonna, it has been a civil society seminar, which has been held pa in parallel uh, to our human rights dialogue and which has fed in the dialogue 
So what I propose is that I send the, the conclusions and the report and the link where you can find it to Francesco, if you agree, and he would distribute it because it is now a public document and there's a lot of interesting substance you can, you can grab from it. So it was a privilege being here and, and exchanging with you and I would not want to monopolize. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. Uh, I think it was uh, productive. Uh, we will write a report of this, uh, of this discussion uh, with the contribution of uh, all of you, and uh, we hope that what we have spoke today will, uh, uh, will help um, and, uh, and, uh, and give us some food for thoughts for, uh, for the upcoming uh, EU, Africa, uh, EU Africa Summit. Uh, please join me uh, with a round of applause for our speakers and uh and we look forward to uh, having you with us again in our uh, upcoming upcoming events. Thank you.